Hi there, it's day two of week 11 of 52 weeks of vlogging, and I'm dressed in blue to give you an important message. Today is International Autism Awareness Day. Now, I actually have a lot of experience with autism. I worked with autistic children for almost four years when I lived in Scotland while my husband was in university. I have a cousin who has autism, and when the older kidlet was four years old, we were told that he had Asperger tendencies. Asperger disorder is something that falls within the autistic spectrum. So autism and Asperger disorder are something that are very close to me they're very important to me. So today I'm going to tell you 10 things that you might or might not know about autism. The first thing is that autistic spectrum disorder is just that. It's a spectrum. There are people at one end who are severely affected who will probably need help for simple basic maintenance tasks like feeding themselves, dressing themselves, toileting themselves, and will need that kind of assistance for the rest of their lives. And then there are people at the other end who are quite high functioning. They'll probably grow up to be able to have a job and live on their own, but they'll still be recognizably different from most people and they'll definitely still need help with certain areas. And then there are a whole lot of people in between all along that spectrum. And it's a social disorder. This means that unlike other things like paranoid schizophrenia where there are specific chemical imbalances in the brain that can be addressed with medication or something like Down syndrome, which has very specific physical characteristics, autistic spectrum disorder is diagnosed through the behavior that's exhibited in the patient. This makes diagnosis tricky because there's no one physical marker that they can just look for and say definitively, yes, you have that. It makes the diagnostic process very fudgy and squishy and gray and not at all consistent or predictable or easy. Additionally, number two, there are 16 specific behavior patterns that people look for when they're looking to diagnose someone with autistic spectrum disorder except that you only have to exhibit eight of the 16. This means that you can have two people with two completely different set of behavioral symptoms who both have autistic spectrum disorder. Now there are three areas into which these 16 different behavioral patterns fall. There are the areas of self-help, social interaction in terms of the language that's used, and imaginative play. For example, a young child with autistic spectrum disorder might not want to dress themselves the way typical young children would. They might show no interest in trying to feed themselves. These would be examples of delays in the area of self-help. In terms of language and social interaction, we would be looking at things like eye contact. A lack of eye contact is typical of autistic spectrum disorder. Additionally, we would be looking at language development. If a child is not mimicking mommy and daddy at a very early age and imitating the sounds mom and dad are making, and if a child isn't using sounds to try to communicate their needs and desires, then that is indicative that there may be some kind of an issue. And in terms of imaginative play, a child with autistic spectrum disorder will often not play with other children. They're more likely to watch other children play and then either copy what the other children are doing or conversely do their own type of play which is typically very repetitive and not very imaginative. For example, lining cars up is a big thing, running toys back and forth over the same thing over and over and over again, or other types of things that we call self-stimulatory activities like spinning in place, banging a head against a wall, jumping off the same piece of furniture over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And I'm not talking about like three or four times, I'm talking about like 50. Autistic spectrum disorder, and I'm just going to call it ASD from now because it's much quicker, is estimated to affect between 1 in 100 children and 1 in 88 children, which is high. It's a lot more than it used to be estimated to affect. Which brings me to my next point, which is that ASD seems to be rising. Why? Well, there are a lot of reasons. It's actually probably a combination of many factors. One is that we have better diagnostic practices. Another reason is probably that we use different terminology now. Autism probably isn't happening more nowadays. It's just that in the old days, anybody with autism was just called crazy and they were lumped into an asylum and left there. So in that sense, what appears to be a rise in autism could actually be a good thing. It means more people are being diagnosed, which means more people are getting treatment and help. In addition to that, we have a different culture now. We have a culture that says, let's seek help for whatever might be ailing you, which in some ways is a good thing because it means people are getting diagnosis and help, but in other ways can be a very, very bad thing because it means that we seem to believe that there should be a pill to cure everything, and that's just not right. Another interesting note about autism and autistic spectrum disorder is that one in every five people with ASD are female, and four in every five people with ASD are male. That might seem kind of random, but when you look at how ASD actually expresses itself, namely in things like lack of eye contact and lack of ability to develop social communication skills, 
spontaneously without specifically being taught them, those tend to be things that happen to boys more than girls anyway. Girls typically are more into social communication than boys. They make eye contact earlier and for longer periods than boys. And the idea that ASD is kind of an extreme version of the male brain is something that was put forward by Dr. Simon Baron Cohen in his book The Essential Difference, Men, Women, and the Extreme Male Brain, which you should definitely read. Yes, his theory has holes in it, but it's still worth considering and thinking about. It gives us a new way to look at ASD, and you can find it in the links down in the description. One interesting and unusual and not something you would necessarily think about thing to do with ASD is that oftentimes parents of children with ASD have a higher than average IQ. In other words, if you average the IQ of parents of ASD kids and you average the IQ of parents of not ASD kids, the ASD parents have a higher number. And this is another one of those things that seems like it could be random, but actually when you examine it a little more closely, it does have an element of sense to it. People with ASD tend to need things to be very, very organized and very, very structured. And people with a higher IQ tend to be a little more anal retentive and a little more type A. Additionally, along with all the problems that ASD brings, sometimes it also brings gifts. I'm not talking about autistic savants, I'm gonna to get to them later. I'm talking about, for example, the tendency to obsess over just one topic, which means that you get really, really knowledgeable about that one topic, almost to the level of being a genius on that topic. Now, I talked about autistic savants, and speaking of autistic savants, they are not that common. They are actually no more common than geniuses are in the regular population. The idea that autism brings with it the savant gift all the time is a complete fallacy. It does happen occasionally, but it doesn't happen more than it happens typically. Next I'm going to talk about food, specifically gluten and casein. Now you've heard a lot about gluten lately, it's kind of the new big thing, gluten is the next big evil, it's something nobody should eat, blah 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 blah. And that may be true, it may be that if you cut gluten out of your diet you can avoid some bloating or some heaviness in your abdomen or feeling slow and tired at the end of the day. But that's not to be confused with what many people with ASD experience when they eat gluten which is an ability to concentrate, higher levels of confusion, higher levels of distraction, seeing things sometimes. There is some science here to back this up and I'm not going to go too deeply into it right now. That's a whole other video and if you want to know about the science behind the gluten and casein issue with autistic people, definitely say so in the comments and I will definitely do a video dedicated just to that topic because gluten and casein intolerance is something that the older kidlet definitely have. But the basic summary is that it's to do with the lack of the necessary digestive enzymes to fully break down gluten and casein into their component parts so that you can digest them and use them properly, combined with what's often termed as leaky gut syndrome, which basically means that your intestines are absorbing molecules larger than the molecules they're supposed to be absorbing, which means that they're able to absorb these not fully broken down gluten and casein derivatives, which then get absorbed into your bloodstream, get into your brain, cause all kinds of crazy shit to happen, and suddenly your kid is banging their head against the wall for six hours a day instead of just one and a half. Or, in the case of the older kidlet, having six meltdowns a day instead of just one meltdown every three or four days. The gluten and casein issue is something that really frustrates me because I've actually had doctors and psychiatrists say to me, no, no, I just don't believe that anything you eat could affect your behavior in that way. At which point I remind them about magic mushrooms, tell them that yes, I believe nobody should eat them, and yes, they're something you eat that yes, definitely affect your behavior in that kind of way. Hello? Additionally, there have been a number of large and small double-blind trials testing the effects of gluten and casein proteins on people with ASD, and yes, they do make a difference. And honestly, avoiding gluten and casein is kind of a pain in the ass. Trust me, I've been doing it for a while. But there are enough substitutes out there that you can make sure that a person is still getting a full, healthy, fully nutritious, and complete diet while still avoiding those two proteins. It's not that hard. It gets easier every day. And if you have issues, it's definitely something worth experimenting with. Since whatever makes it into your bloodstream also eventually makes it into your pee, you can have urine tests done to check for gluten and casein intolerance. Contact a local naturopath. Finally, number nine, the idea that autistic people don't have interest in other people or don't have feelings is just wrong. Autistic people definitely have interest in other people. One little girl I worked with who had Asperger disorder would literally walk up to every person on the bus telling them her name, her address, asking what their name and address were. She would give them her phone number and ask for theirs back. She was really interested in other people. What she didn't have was the understanding that it's not socially acceptable to just 
spill out your name and address and phone number to total strangers, especially when you're only nine. And autistic people definitely have feelings. They feel happy and sad and confused and angry and excited just like everybody else does. What they don't have is the ability to tell what your feelings are based on your facial expression. Babies and toddlers pick up on things like this and on how to speak our language as they grow up and get older, but kids with ASD don't. They need to be taught specifically. And that brings me to my last point, point number 10, which is that there is no cure for autism. What there is, is treatment. One-on-one -on -one behavioral therapy has been proven repeatedly to help kids with autism. And it's not a cure for autism, and many would argue that we shouldn't be trying to cure autism because, as I said, ASD can be a double-edged sword. But what it does do is teach a person with autism how to cope with the things that they struggle with. It teaches them valuable life skills like self-care. It can teach them language. I literally taught children how to talk. And it can teach them how to read those weird, vague social cues that they struggle with so often. There are two things that I really want you to take away from this video, and one is that there is something you can do. Whether you know someone who has autism or not, you can contact a local autism charity, or you can contact a national autism charity like Autism Speaks. You can talk about writing letters to your congressman or council person or whoever the person is who makes the rules and sets the guidelines and decides things like, are we going to fund families getting treatment for their autistic kid or not? Write letters, write lots of letters. And the other thing you can do is if you see someone in your classroom or on the bus or at the grocery store or in the mall or anywhere else who just seems a little weird, maybe they're looking at the floor a lot or maybe they're spinning in circles or maybe they seem to be saying the same thing over and over and over again, don't stare at them. Don't walk away embarrassed from them. And definitely, definitely don't ever, ever say mean things about them behind their back, whether they can hear you or not. Because they can't help being what they are, and they didn't ask to be what they are. It's not a choice, and it's not something that they want. And that person is probably doing those things because places like schools and malls and grocery stores and buses are really stressful environments for a person who doesn't understand people that well. And just because they don't understand people doesn't mean they don't want to. So try to be understanding, try to be kind, offer them a smile, and don't force them to talk to you or look at you if they don't want to. Because they're just doing the best they can. And getting out there into school or into the store or on the bus might have been a major milestone. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.